So security uh, probably being the, the one uh, department that ideally functions around the clock, 24 hour security. And that security goes beyond the cameras that are mounted in the ceilings. It's the actual physical presence. So when you go downtown to the Mokna Museum, um, you'll, you'll see the people in uniforms, they are the security. And ideally, they are on call and are alert uh, for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And then curation. At the very base, it could be collection registration, although some museums have a registrar, and that registrar position is entirely separate from the person who's the curator. You have collection care, sometimes conservation, and an awful lot of research as a curator. And that's why in this class we are going to be spending a good amount of time doing research so that we are making informed decisions. And that research is not only the history of the objects with which we're working, it's research about what's going on in the world as we speak. That we are staying abreast of current trends, current technologies, current issues. So the research is beyond historical research. In many ways, your research is planning for the future or creating a future. So some of the typical responsibilities as a curator, you are, in many museums, you're expected to be a specialist in that discipline that's related to the museum collections. So if you're at the uh, Museum of Modern Art, it's expected that you are going to have at least probably a PhD with a specialization in modern and contemporary art. Now, one of the things that, in some disciplines, modern is differentiated from contemporary. Contemporary is what's happening now as compared to modern, which dies somewhere in the 90s. Modern pretty much uh, is seen as uh, sta sta starting somewhere around pop art, just after expre abstract expressionism, and then going somewhere uh, into the 90s or so. Um, some, some art historians actually make those type of um, distinctions. Because you might say, well, aren't we modern today? Some will Indian thumb wrestle with you and say, no, we're contemporary today. Warhol was modern and pop at the same time. Rauschenberg was abstract expressionist and modern at the same time. You may have care of uh, the academic as well as cultural interpretations of all the objects that are either owned or lent to the museum. You might, based on your expertise, be called upon to recommend which objects or kinds of objects based on the museum's collecting interest to acquire, to actually go out and find and acquire and, and even raise the funding to be able to acquire them. Or you may find out that there are objects in your collection you are wasting your money on to ensure them because they really don't fit with the museum's philosophy or intent. So you may actually suggest, well, we don't need this one. So is there another museum that's willing to buy it or can we donate it as a tax uh, write-off to another institution? So you may be suggesting, in some ways you might actually not only be pulling objects in, but you'll be calling others so that your museum stays as specified as it needs to be. You may be called upon for attributions. Attributions means assigning um, the maker, you know, who made it. Or attribution could also include provenance. Provenance means the history of ownership of an object. So not only who owned it, but where they were, when they acquired it, when they let it go, and the like. And then authentication. And this is uh, particularly uh, an important role in many Native American historic museums because there is a lot of, uh, uh, one of the things when I worked in a gallery, I saw that there were a lot of things that came in sometimes for an auction that were out and out fake, but they looked really good. And they were made by non-natives. And they would fool many people, myself included. They were so good. that may not be as much of a concern in a cultural center. Because in a cultural center, you're, you're, you're worried about the use of the object and the maintenance of the object. 
as compared to an historic museum where it's supposed to have that, not only the physical integrity, but the historical integrity too. So you may, based on your expertise, be called upon to authenticate certain things. You may be doing research, or research, research uh, for the collection and then putting that research in publications. And you may have some administrative or exhibition related responsibilities, depending on how small the staff is for your museum. So this is the typical kinds of responsibilities you would expect. Some of the typical qualifications might be an advanced degree concentrated on the museum's specialization. I mentioned that a little bit earlier. You may uh, be required to have experience in museum or educational or research organizations. So sometimes there are university professors who have taught art history, um, and for that matter, you know, even oceanic art history, and then are able to get a, a job as a curator in New Zealand because of their expertise in um, oceanic history. You also often will have to have evidence of scholarly research and publication. Uh, that uh, it means that in many ways you have to have a paper trail. That may not be as important in a cultural center. A cultural center may want you to have proven experience in community organization or community involvement, volunteer work, culturally relevant and educationally relevant activities. So depending on where we are, these kinds of qualifications may have a little bit of wiggle room. And if you don't have at least a, uh, a generalized sense, you might need it in one major area of a museum's collections uh, because the museum may have several areas of specialty or expertise um, that that museum collects. You need to be able to interpret as well as communicate important knowledge about the objects in that collection. And in interpretation, uh, the more that we are able to research, the more that we learn about the objects, the more uh, creative we can be in our interpretations. And really, at the base of mounting an exhibit, curating an exhibit, you're telling a story. And that story is one that you have developed in your own mind based on your interpretation of the objects as well as the provenance of those objects. You're telling a story. And then how successfully are you able to communicate that story in such a way that people who view these objects walk away knowing the story that you told? You may need to have a knowledge of not only the selection, the evaluation, the preservation, restoration, uh, and exhibit methodologies. It depends, once again, on the institution. And there's a difference between restoration and preservation. When you are restoring something, you are trying to get it back to looking like its original state. Which means, uh, this is one of the things that I saw working with religious art, that there are categories of what they call santos. Um, yeah, santos. Uh, uh, where these are artists who are creating, or santeros, I'm sorry, who are creating uh, Christian art. And then a kind of art they create are santos, the saints. And they have different categories. So there, for example, when you are looking at a, uh, a it's called a bulto. I like to call bultos Christian gachinas. Because when you look at a gachina, you see all of the accoutrements about that carving that let you know what that figure is. So, for example, you can tell a crow mother gachina carving. Right? You can tell a whipper gachina carving, an ogre gachina carving. The same way you can look at a bulto, a wooden carving, of San, San Antonio de Padua. How do you know it's San Antonio? He's going to be wearing a blue robe. It's going to be tied off with a gold braid rope. And he's going to be carrying a little statue of little baby Jesus. And when you look at that, you get a story. You know, if you know the story, you know why he's carrying the little baby Jesus. Now, 
I remember working with one gallery where the baby Jesus was gone. So you've got San Antonio, I guess, before the event that allowed him to hold baby Jesus. Well, people don't want half the story. So they actually made another little baby Jesus. They had to add something to it. So very often, restoration is an additive process. You may even be destroying part of an object to restore another part. If there is a hole, for example, a, a, a gouge that is in Antonio's robe, and you want to restore it, well, it's a bulto. It stands about this tall. It's on a flat wooden base. So they went underneath the base and carved out a little bit of wood and then inserted it into the hole and then did as best they could to match the pigment. So you couldn't tell the hole was there. So that was a subtractive and additive uh, task that that restorer had to do. As compared to conservation, where you are not taking away, nor are you adding. You are, through the environmental and storage conditions, trying to maintain that object in the best condition you can. I mean, it's almost like zombie objects. They never die. But you also have to have a knowledge of the market, believe it or not, particularly if you are going to deaccession objects and you want to sell them. There are some museums that there are amazing works of art that they have they can no longer keep because the insurance for one particular object may be beyond the budget they can afford. There are an awareness of ethics which are our codes of appropriate conduct. And you also need to have knowledge of the regulations related to art and objects in your area of expertise. So in a nutshell, curators have been historically responsible to research and develop collections in the various institutions and exhibitions. Contemporary curators are in a huge way through their research and through their scholarly endeavors are creating an awareness of art, but also are contributing to the public dialogue about art by making the various works accessible through exhibitions, through openings, through publications, through film and media and the internet to the public. You also, as a curator, are creating opportunities for artists particularly in contemporary art, because if, you know, I mean, um, Jackson Pollock's not gonna benefit. He's already gone, been gone for a while. So um, in particular, these opportunities are to already established, or if you find someone who uh, you think is going to be a superstar, because when you've done a lot of research, you start to recognize people who are what we might call avant-garde, at the cutting edge of creativity and art. Now, while curators are working mostly with visual artists, you also are looking at other types of intellectual and creative uh, contributions from other disciplines, which would include performing art, for example. And that uh, some museums actually have exhibits of performing art. Have you ever heard of James Luna? He's performance art. And the thing about curating one of those kinds of exhibits, for example, is your artist is the art. And they are what they call ephemeral. Ephemeral means here in the moment, and once that performance is done, it's gone. So unless you were there, you didn't see it. 